After I had that moment of realization, I was really depressed for two days. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been that depressed about acting ever, but I was just like, oh, I, it was almost like you, because my whole life had been geared towards doing this and I had always felt like an overachiever in it. And then all of a sudden I wasn't at all. And I was like, oh, I'm actually like not very good at this right now. I think it's something that definitely needed to happen to me as a performer. And I'm so grateful that it did because I'm so much better at it now. Um, but it was a really tough one to swallow. And then, so I took two days of being really down and then I thought, okay, I'm gonna come back fighting. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Karen Gillan is an actor on the occasion of the release of a movie she wrote, directed, and stars in called The Party's Just Beginning. We sat down together to talk about the work. I'd be interested to know if you can tell me like a very brief, <laughs> it's gonna sound like a crazy question, a very brief life story of your acting process. Like mm -hmm. your, the impetus to act, you could start with that. Yeah, um, okay, so I am from Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, that's kind of a rural place. It's, it's pretty secluded and small, um, and the arts culture is, is a big part of growing up there. Um, I wonder if it's because it's quite secluded and, and people find ways to kind of entertain themselves and, and it's just like really part of our culture to, to sort of perform. Um, how did it even begin for me? I remember I got a karaoke machine when I was like really young and it was my favourite possession that I've ever owned in my life. And I worked out one day that you can record yourself um, speaking onto a tape and then have it forever. Um, and that was just honestly like, I was flabbergasted by the notion of this. And so I started recording myself every single day. I have these diaries from when I was a child when in, in every day I'd written record, 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 record. Um, kind of like what we're doing right now really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just me talking. Um, I don't even know what I was talking about, but I was just fascinated. Um, and then I think I started to do like little scenes and maybe an American accent or something. And then I realized I could record myself being a different person. And that was just so much fun for me. It was the most entertaining thing in the world, especially for an only child when there's no siblings running around distracting you <laughs> from what you're doing. Um, and so I did that and then I got this bug for doing different accents and playing different characters. I used to play like this granny that was from the south, like an American oh, wow. granny that would be like, turn that thing off! <laughs> and it sounded like that. <laughs> and I would go around doing this character and then I started doing it to people in school, like performing for them. And then, and then my dad tells a story of when I pointed at the television and said, excuse me, how do I get in there? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I wanted to climb in essentially and yeah. interact with all the people in there. And I think probably from then on, I knew that I did really want to do that. And I quickly realized you can't crawl in to the screen. You're gonna have to find another way in. So then, um, so there wasn't a lot of acting classes available for me when I was a child. There was one called the Florians, which I joined the waiting list for. And let me tell you, I am still on that waiting list. <laughs> they still haven't called me. <laughs> um, so it was a long waiting list. And then all of a sudden, all of these new classes opened up in the top of Scotland. And so I was able to train seven days a week in different things. I mean, some of it was music and, and some of it was dancing, which is ridiculous because I'm a terrible dancer, but it was all kind of performance related. And then when I was 16, I moved to Edinburgh and studied acting specifically at college, which is um, not university in the UK. It's like um, it's in between high school and university. Uh -huh. So I did that for a year and then I moved to London to go to drama school and studied there for a few months and was doing all of that. And it's, it was completely theater based. And then I dropped out to start working as an actor. And then your big break was, was Doctor Who, right? Yeah. I mean, would that be considered the break? Yes. Was this just like life changing? And, and what was that like as in terms of like, as a development of your craft? Well, I mean, yeah, so that was a big break for me. I, I mean, it was, I mean, it's like one of the biggest breaks you can get if not the biggest break on British television for a girl to get this role. So it was absolute insanity. I mean, I was 21. I came from complete obscurity, mm. got this role, and suddenly the BBC were 
asking me if I had any skeletons in my closet. <laughs> there was, I don't, yeah. by the way, I would like to point out. <laughs> um, and there was like all of these journalists within an hour of the announcement of me playing the role, like at my parents' house in Scotland. It's like, how did they even get there that fast? Um, so it was like absolute madness. It's like something that I took in my stride at the time, but I think if it happened to me now, I, would, I wouldn't know how to quite handle it properly um, because it was a lot. But it was also amazing. I had blind optimism um, because I was so young on my side. And then when I started on the show, it was just incredible for my acting. I feel like I improved immensely. Um, I mean, so much. Because when you're acting that much every day for nine months of the year, I'm talking like all day, yeah, every day, yeah. and you're in every scene, you are exercising the muscle in a way that a lot of actors aren't because jobs can be so sporadic. Right. Um, and even if you're doing a movie every so often, which is what a lot of people aim for, you're not exercising it quite in the same way as doing it every single day. So of course you're going to get better. Um, and you know, acting in something like that compared to something that you would consider more challenging as an actor, ultimately it's the same thing. I mean, you need to find the truth in the situation, no matter what, what the situation is. Sometimes it can be even more challenging to find the truth in the situation when you're flying around space being chased by an alien and trying to inject that with something that feels real and authentic is definitely a challenge. Right. You were talking about like, people showing up at your parents house or whatever or, uh -huh. or, or something like that then going into these other movies that are also have a huge fan base Marvel movies and, and everything and being involved in this um, kind of uh, uh, both excitement and kind of a distraction to the work mm. in a way is that is it something that is getting tiring scary uh, annoying or is it just like part of the excitement let's keep it going um, well I guess I don't have a typical view on that because the first thing I the first big thing I ever did was completely surrounded by fandom right. <laughs> I mean to such a high degree in the UK and also in America um, but like so I have a skewed sort of view on that because I kind of was spoiled from the beginning with having people care about what we're making and then I sort of experienced indie movies after that where you just don't have you have to fight to make people interested in in right. what you're making and it's like whoa this is a lot harder than just having people wanting to know everything about what you're doing yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's something that I think I probably just have become accustomed to um, just because of the way it all started uh, but it's not something that I find distracting, to be honest. I think that it's an energy source if you can use it for a positive thing. Where people, yeah. you know, you, you want to do well for the people that will be watching and you know that they will be watching and it just kind of adds to the excitement of the whole thing. Oh, that's interesting. I like that. You like kind of like spinning it, like you mm. know they're going to be hyper-focused. Yeah. And you kind of like spin it to your own, get you fueled up. Yeah, it way. gets me hyper focused and yeah, and yeah, I like a challenge. I like that. Can I read you something? So this is a quote that you said, but you can tell me if it's not exactly right. Mm. I was delusional about my own abilities when I was acting. I was really confident that I was good at it. Then I had an awakening when I realized I wasn't as good as I thought I was. I watched myself in something and thought, oh my God, this is terrible. I need to get back to work on this and figure out how this is done. Yeah, that's true. Did say that. But tell me, like, is this just you seeing something that you want to improve on? It was almost like coming at it from a technical standpoint where, like, okay, so I don't know if this, this sort of metaphor is going to work, but I'm going to try. Like, if you were a tennis player, right, you would probably watch back your games to see how you're doing and how those shots worked and how they didn't. So that's kind of the way I approach acting. Um, but like, if, if the tennis player was to kind of map out all of the shots that they were going to do um, and they just executed them perfectly but were not responsive to the other player, then it's not very alive, is it? Right. That's because they need to throw their map out the window and be completely present and available right. and 
watching and listening to the other person. And so that's where I think I was going wrong in acting. I kind of had all of these thoughts mapped out. I, I knew exactly how I wanted them to come across and I just wasn't free enough and I don't think I was responding to the other actors. So therefore, if you watch it, it's not terrible acting, but it's just, it's not that magical acting where something just comes out of nowhere and you surprise yourself and everybody else and it's impulsive and, and in that moment, true. Right. And what did you do about this? Well, after I had that moment of realization, I was really depressed for two days. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been that depressed about acting ever, but I was just like, oh, I, it was almost like you, because my whole life had been geared towards doing this and I had always felt like an overachiever in it. And then all of a sudden I wasn't at all. And I was like, oh, I'm actually like not very good at this right now. Um, I think it's something that definitely needed to happen to me as a performer and I'm so grateful that it did because I'm so much better at it now. Um, but it was a really tough one to swallow. And then so I took two days of being really down and then I thought, okay, I'm going to come back fighting. So I went to set the next day on Doctor Who and just started trying things that weren't things that I had planned. Uh, it wasn't the one set way of delivering something. I just decided to throw the hat I was wearing at someone. Uh, and I just decided to kind of surprise the other actor. And he is an actor that's very kind of inventive and responsive and really thrives in that type of situation. And then he loved it because he was like, oh, I have something that's surprising me now too. Okay, this feels alive between us. Um, and it was like a totally different experience. And yeah, I probably did some things that were too far at the beginning of that. But you have to kind of allow yourself to fail as an artist. I mean, that's key. And you keep trying that. And then every time you do it, you're getting a little bit better. And your, your judgment's getting a little more honed into what works and what doesn't work. Um, and now I try to literally make every single take that I do different so that it's the first time I'm doing something every time. When was the first realization that you wanted to direct and that you wanted to make your own content? Um, I think that was when I got a video camera when I was a kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I graduated from the yeah. karaoke machine yeah. to the visual side of recording. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I made some horror films um, and I cast my parents in roles and I was directing them. And it's funny because even when I watched that back when I was like a 12 year old, I remember thinking, I do acting classes. My acting should be better than what this is right now. <laughs> like, but I just didn't really think about it. But it's like, when you watch yourself, you can realize these things. So I personally am a huge fan of watching oneself as an mm -hmm. actor um, because you can really see how things are coming across and, and if you like something, if you don't. Yeah. You just need to get over the excruciating pain right. of your own face and voice. I, you know, when I, when I make things, of course we're talking on a low level here, I never want to show the actors the work until it's all done. I have this weird right, thing, yeah. you know, like that, that uh, it's going to mess them up, but maybe that's wrong. Like well, the, I, I agree with not showing them in the middle of shooting. I think that can definitely throw people off yeah. and almost make them too aware that they are shooting a movie. Right, um, right. So I don't think I would be you mean encouraging. All, when it's all done. When it's you, done. Yeah. yeah, I mean. So you don't go to dailies and watch stuff or st stuff like that? No, I've stopped. You can definitely become addicted to playback as an actor. Uh, once you open that gate, you can, you, you want to see everything. You want to see how it went. Like, but I don't do that at all. I've definitely gone down that road and thought, no, I'd actually like to just not be so self-aware and just be present in what I'm doing. And when it's done, I'll watch it and then take what I want from that. And do you, this whole time when you were on Doctor Who and similar other things around that time, were you always thinking, I want to be making my own movies? Um, I think it was always in the back of my mind, but it wasn't at the forefront because yeah. I wanted to be an actress so much and I was finally getting to do it every day. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't thinking like that. But then as soon as I finished on Doctor Who and I had a little more time to kind of think, um, that's when I started writing this project. So that was like six years ago. Wow, wow. Were you, were you starting to get worried though about this being your first directorial thing and having to be in it and it being such a harrowing kind of mm. thing where some of these scenes are are, are going to take a lot out of you. Uh, yeah, actually, I think the closer we got to shooting it, then I tried to back out of playing the lead role. <laughs> um, and I was like, what if I can get someone better or more famous? <laughs> and they were like, OK, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The financiers didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. um, but like, I, it, when it came down to it, I just couldn't part with the role. 
I did consider it for a while, but it was kind of too late in the game and also I don't know if I would have been able to part with it because I kind of wrote it for myself. You know, someone could look at this and be like, wow, this is really dark. Like, what's going on in her head if, yeah. this, <laughs> if this is so dark? If this is so dark, like when it really, when I really started to really connect with this character was when she's talking to the old man. Mm. When I saw it again, I realized how difficult those phone conversations are with him. Mm. The state your character is in is you're, you're not going to be forthcoming with information to any just anyone. Like no. m most of your interactions are joking with people, and you kind of make fun of people, and like it, yeah. you know, and you, you stand offish. But something happens there where you think that's a safe place. Yeah. To reveal some things, and the movie needs you to reveal some things. Like, mm. like that's the interesting thing. Like, usually that kind of it's almost like expositional scenes that happen yeah. are done in a way that's like, all right, I know this information has to be given to me because otherwise yeah. the movie's going to fall apart. But the way you handle it is so sensitively, right on tone-wise. And I was just wondering if you were thinking about all that, or if it's just coming natural to you. And it, like you said, if you got a, a bigger celebrity or something, I don't know if they would understand that even. How did how did nail that like you did? Well, thanks. <laughs> um, you know what's funny about that is that um, it's kind of it's, uh, it's sort of true. <laughs> um, when I was growing up, my parents' phone line it was one digit off oh. from a helpline. I never engaged in a conversation with anyone that was fictional, but like we were always getting calls oh. from people trying to get through to the Samaritans helpline. Um, and then my mum even sort of engaged with a woman, and they went to bingo together, like. Or they definitely planned, yeah. And it was, um, and so it was just kind of this interesting detail about my life that I've always thought that's so interesting. And it's funny because, like, if you write it into a movie, there is an element of like this kind of seems like a convenient plot device to kind of learn about the character. But in my mind, I'm like, it's true. Um, yeah. But with those scenes in particular, I think it was really important, acting-wise, to have the um, actor playing the old man on the phone present, so he was yeah. there, yeah. Um, actually like speaking through the phone. Yeah. And then what I did with him and me was I would get the scenes as scripted, and then I asked him to just improvise a version of it, just say whatever he wanted. He could say some of the lines, he could say none of the lines. Mm. I call it a fun run and it's something I do with every actor that I work with mm. now. Um, once it's all in the can, just do a fun run and anything goes. Yeah. Um, and so most of those takes are the fun runs. Ah, of, of the conversations? Yeah. Really? Yeah, because everybody loosens up. The actor relaxes when they feel it, it's in the can. And right. then they just start but, going But off. also you, though, too. You, uh, yeah, when I'm talking about the actors, I'm referring to myself <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, are you, but during that, are you also thinking, like, you also have the director hat on, too, at the same time, mm. right? And, it, like, and if they're throwing out something, and it might be good for you as a, as a performer because you're throwing off and you can deliver an authentic reaction, but mm. what if it's not... If you're like, oh, I wish he would just say this so that I can say that, and you know, I mean, yeah. it would, it's almost like too much of a. Oh, I, I mean, I'm now I'm more fascinated <laughs> that those were fun runs, because most I of the they, movie is fun runs. <laughs> is <that right>? yeah. <laughs> but I know what you mean. Like, yeah, when people know the pressure's off, yeah. they have some kind of other everybody thing relaxes going on. a little bit, right? And then you can get to the get to the really interesting stuff, the stuff that doesn't really look like acting because they right. might not get the lines right, they might stutter, they might do all of the natural things that humans do. Right, but tell me, get, get me into the nuts and bolts a little bit of this though, like having to direct and then having to take that hat off, put on the actor hat, get in front of the camera for mm. some of these scenes, like what was your specific process to really take that director hat off and get in the moment? You know, it, it wasn't an issue for me. You know, I think um, getting into the moment is something that can definitely be practiced as an actor. Um, Tell I me have how. Tell me how. By doing it over and over again. I have this actor friend who constantly complains that she doesn't feel in the zone and she just doesn't feel present. And I made a self-tape with her, uh, reading the other lines while filming her, and she, I could see that she just wasn't... She, she always says she, she doesn't feel dropped in. Yeah. And I'm thinking... 
you're overthinking it. <laughs> you need oh, yeah. to just, even if you don't feel dropped in, just keep going anyway rather than stopping. And so I tried something on her where I was just like, I shouted at her. I was like, just do it, act. And she was like, uh -huh. and I was like, act it, no. <laughs> and she just did it. And so like, I think it's, it sometimes can be helped with just like, like just snap out of it a little bit. Right, right. Don't overthink it. And even if you don't feel dropped in for that take, just keep going. Um, and the more you do that, the more automatic it will become, which is something I learned from working on television where you're filming all day, every day. It gets to the point where you don't need to worry about feeling dropped in at all. You can have a conversation, you can laugh, they're just about to call action, you're still laughing, action, and then you can just turn mm -hmm. it on. And I, th I really do believe that that is something that can be practiced. I read somewhere that you were really wanting to continue to direct, you know, that this is what you want to do. And here's a question that you can't answer. Is this freaking out your representatives? Are your people... <laughs> well... <laughs> Another part, I'll yes. probably edit out. No, you don't have to. <laughs> they said they're plowing on ahead with the acting and they're not listening <laughs> to that. <laughs> is, that is, is that real? Is that real? They, they meant it in a really nice way, but they aren't going to be, you know, hitting the brakes on, on the acting, um, which is fine because I love doing both. So you do want to do both. I mean, this is not like... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't part ways with acting. I just don't think I can. I mean, maybe for a second I thought I could just after I directed this and I'd fallen in love, but then I fell in love with acting again. So I'm going to have to have an affair with directing. Right, right. And <laughs> be sneaking around on, the, on some of these <laughs> yeah. folks. Uh, and I also heard, which was scary, that you don't want to be in anything you direct. Oh, I always say that. <laughs> but then I'll fall in love with the part because I'll just write my dream role. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... Was it because it was hard? Um, no, it wasn't as hard as you'd expect. I mean, because I just basically gave myself five options because I was doing something different in every take so that I could then construct the performance in the edit. So it really wasn't that difficult. It's just, it's just frustrating because you can't do all the director stuff of you know, being behind the monitor, watching how something's being conveyed, how it's coming across, what the composition of the shots are. So it just felt like I was missing out on, an, on one element. Right, right. And you'd, w you'd rather just settle into that element yeah, I mean, be, if I yeah. want to make like a truly great m movie, I think I need to be able to be behind the monitor. <laughs> yeah. Do you engage in some kind of practice to keep you sharp when you're not acting? This is the thing. This sort of ties into what I was talking about when you're on a TV show. You are staying sharp because you're doing it every day and it becomes second nature. Right. And when you're on camera that much, it's just, it's your playground. It's your environment your yeah. area to it's a safe place um, however when you don't have that regular access to it it is really hard to sort of drop in as, as I said before um, or it can be um, and so this is something I've actually spoke about a lot with my actor friends and then somebody said something to me that was interesting I said I said to her I am nervous that I won't be able to act as well as I normally can because I haven't been doing it in a while and she says that's insanity because she could go to prison for 50 years and come out a much better actor because she would have so much life experience. She would have far more depth. Mm. <laughs> um, there would be probably be a lot more going on, you know, just internally. Right. And so I thought that was a really interesting way of looking at it where, you know, you can have life experiences and that is absolutely going to inform you, your right. acting. Right. And so I kind of look at it like that, although I do believe practice is good. And so I try to watch as much good acting as I can when I'm not acting, because yeah. then you can still be learning. And I try to just do short films that friends are making, be involved in that sort of stuff to just kind of exercise the muscles a little bit. Right. The thing that I do most that I think feeds into the work, um, I don't read a lot of um, fiction, but I read a lot and watch a lot on psychology. Mm. And so, um, I mean, and it makes sense, it would definitely feed into the acting when you are essentially studying psycho the psychology of this fictitious person that you need to bring to life. And you need to understand them and you need to have empathy towards them. And so, and it's just my greatest passion in life is watching these videos and, and reading about just overall psychology and, and the human mind and behavior. So I spend a lot of time doing that just because I love it, but also it does feed into 
emulating human behavior. Yes. Karen Gillen, thank you. Thanks. Hope you come back. I would love to. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. It's produced by Spencer Rain. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.